Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy. Leadership development told through the lens of Star Trek. Your host, Jeff Aiken, is a 20-year veteran of the public and private sectors in management and leadership. He specializes in helping people unlock their true potential and is a huge Star Trek fan. And now, here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Have you ever had a manager get in your face or write an all caps email freaking out over a deadline or an issue? Have you ever done that to someone you work with? Sadly, it happens all too often because we confuse what is critical with what is urgent or even routine. Let's break down what that means and how to be sure your response is appropriate to the situation as we watch the third episode of the second season of the animated series, The Practical Joker. The Enterprise is doing a geological survey and they're wrapping up. I love the older stuff like this. They totally acknowledge the work, right? Work of working on a starship, the day-to-day. Well, as they head out, they run into three Romulan ships. They immediately attack and the evasive maneuvers are on. Mr. Spock, who the devil's attacking us? Romulans, Captain. They detect an uncharted energy field and decide to head into it, hoping the Romulans will beg off. The Romulans turn back rather than risk the energy field. The ship sets to repairs, and we're back to business as usual. Out of nowhere, a series of pranks and practical jokes start happening. Hey, this glass just leaked all over me. How do you like that? So did mine. They write it off as a practical joker or maybe some problems with the food synthesizers, but they keep coming. Like, Spock gets the dark rings around his eyes from looking into a scope. Scotty gets buried in a bunch of food when he orders a grilled cheese, and and he ends up with a cream pie in the face. One of my favorites, and maybe the most iconic prank, happens early on, too. I've just picked up my clean uniforms from the service chute, and when I put this one on, I discovered this. On the back of his shirt, it says, Kirk is a jerk. (laughs) Classic. But the fun is starting to wear thin, and the crew are starting to look for blame. Go ahead and laugh. Big joke. I'll bet you two are responsible for this, eh? Hey, wait a minute. We didn't cause this to happen. The jokes start getting a little less funny and a little more dangerous. The corridor floor gets covered in ice, and Kirk and Spock nearly take a nosedive. And then the computer reveals itself as the Joker. It starts taunting everybody. (laughs) There's that laugh again. Something awfully familiar about it. The evidence all points to one guilty party, Captain. I believe our practical joker is the Enterprise itself. Kirk initiates a full diagnostic scan of the ship, which which sucks for Sulu, Uhura, and McCoy because they were just heading off to their break. Good. The rec room is unoccupied. For whatever reason, they don't hear the call to stations while they decide how to spend their time away. And this, this is pretty cool. They are on a holodeck. On the OG-1701 Enterprise, they go from a beach scene to the woods, and then they start taking a stroll. But they aren't safe either. The computer does the old hole-in-the-ground covered with brush trick, and then it switches the program from the woods to freezing blizzard conditions. The rest of the crew are hard at work trying to figure out what's going on and where the three rec rumors are, leading to what might be my favorite moment in the whole episode. Question. Why are we unable to communicate with crew members McCoy, Sulu, and Uhura? Answer, that is for me to know and for you to find out. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And it goes on and on. Kirk tries doing the whole outsmart the computer thing that's worked for him so many times in the original series. You are programmed to obey any direct order I may give, correct? Correct. Very well, I order you to release crew members McCoy, Sulu, and Uhura immediately. Say, please. Well, I'll be. I suggest compliance, Captain. Please. And then he just gives up. He's had enough. He asks Scotty to shut down all the logic functions for the computer. But that does not go well. The computer shuts off the gravity. Spock says he's got a theory about what's going on and tells Scotty to abort the shutdown mission. Spock says the Enterprise was likely infected by subatomic particles from the energy field they went through. Despite his confidence about his theory, 
He has no idea what to do about it. And then things take a turn for the worse. Scotty, we need a work crew with power tools to open a frozen door. Have them report to... <laughs> report to... <laughs> Captain, what is it? The computer is flooding the ship with nitrous oxide. Laughing gas, which I'll tell you from personal experience, doesn't quite work like this. Spock, not as affected by it, is able to switch to emergency air. The repair crew get to the rec room and bust through the door, freeing them just in time. The computer goes from kind of fun to galactically threatening in a heartbeat. No more practical jokes. Now it's taking control of the helm and sends the Enterprise towards the neutral zone. If they enter that zone, it'll be considered an act of war by the Romulans. The three Romulan ships from earlier move to intercept them, and then the computer, well, the uh, the computer launches a life-size replica balloon of the Enterprise out into space. Hmm. Well, feeling outnumbered, the Romulans pull off. Kirk realizes this is all a huge practical joke, but this time, it's on the Romulans. He figures the Romulans will attack the balloon. And Romulans fear disgrace more than death. And if the dudes back home on Romulus hear they blowed up a balloon and not a starship? Yeah, not good for them. Well, they take the bait and chase for the real Enterprise. Kirk starts freaking out. Things aren't funny anymore at all. He's terrified of the energy field that was in the area. I couldn't face going through there again. Oh, but he wasn't afraid. This was a classic Kirk ruse. The computer sends the ship back into the energy field, and the Romulans follow them in. While in the field, for some reason, the subatomic particles are released from the Enterprise, and they're back to normal. But the Romulans are not. Shall we tell them how they can reverse the effects of the field, Jim? Yes, but later. And we all have a good laugh at their expense. Every single time we've gotten an animated series episode on here, I've really enjoyed it. The series gets a bad rap, and totally unfairly. Yes, the animation is ridiculous, but the stories are great. I can absolutely, 100% see this as an episode slotted into, like, the third season of the original series. Heighten the stakes a little bit, maybe get some more back and forth with the Romulans, but this is a great sci-fi story. It's been told by so many franchises and properties... And Star Trek does an awesome job with it in this one. Come to Quark's Crisis Fun. Come right now. Go, Quark. Run! One ping only. Please. As I thought, John Rennie's new book, All in the Same Boat, is right over there. It's at allinthesameboatbook.com. Your orders are to get there now. And remember, be careful what you shoot at. Most things in here don't react too well to bullets. I do carry a select line of unique artifacts and gemstones indigenous to this region. A couple things to bring us up to speed on the animated series itself. The casting has always been a hot topic. They brought back all of the original cast, including Majel Barrett, to voice their characters. And some, notably Majel, Nichelle Nichols, and James Doohan, voiced basically anyone that wasn't already covered as an existing character. But, for some reason, Walter Koenig, Chekhov, was not cast. He did write an episode, which we talked about in the 68th episode of the podcast, The, the Infinite Vulcan. I mean... At different points in the series, they even they even brought back Mark Leonard as Sarek, and even Roger C. Carmel as Harry Mudd, but, but no Koenig, and no Chekhov. But don't think that puts him down a character, oh no. We actually end up plus one on the main crew. Being animated, the sky was the limit when it came to visuals, so we got two entirely alien crew members. Lieutenant Mores, a Cation communications officer, and Lieutenant Eriks, an Adosian navigator, voiced by Majel Barrett and James Doohan, respectively. Morass, as a new character, actually gets quite a bit of screen time and does some pretty cool stuff through the series. In this episode, though, she just happened to be the one sitting at comms when Uhura wasn't. But this, on the podcast, is our first chance to talk about Cations. They are, as the name implies, kinda like cat people. Imagine a human with feline features and fur. 
after TAS, the animated series, we see them in Star Trek IV, you know, the one with the whales, and then again in Prodigy and Lower Decks. And Lower Decks in Dr. Ta'ana gives us a lot more insight into them as a species, but at this point, we get to see Acacia doing her thing on the bridge, and I think that's pretty cool. The character of Eryx, though, really leans into the whole being an animated alien thing. He's orangish reddish with an oddly shaped hairless head and dude's got three arms and three legs he's got the standard humanoid left and right arms and then one sticking right out of his chest but remember when i said there was no check off in the series well eric's that's his replacement he's an adosian a species we don't learn much about and we don't see another one until an episode in the third season of lower decks while neither of these characters are earth shattering in their roles they really show the advantages of being animated instead of live action. One piece of what I think is cool trivia from this one that I admittedly have to really stretch for is that it was written by Chuck Menvel. Chuck and fellow Star Trek writer Len Jansen, who worked on this episode, were nominated for an Academy Award in 1968 for a short film they put together. And while that's interesting, the cool trivia is that Chuck's son is Scott Menville. If you are of a certain age or you have children of a certain age, you know Scott as Robin from Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go. Sorry, excuse me, I'm just uh, enjoying these sour grapes you brought. What you got there, sour grapes? You got a grip of sour grapes. I said it during the recap, but I think it's important to note that there is a holodeck in this episode. They played the holodeck for a big reaction right out of the gate in Encounter at Farpoint, but the animated series beat you to it. I also really appreciate that the very first appearance of a holodeck, or rec room as they call it here, is one where it malfunctions and puts the crew in danger. The paint-by-numbers script for so many TNG and other holodeck episodes was written all the way back in 1974. Its age really shows, though. McCoy drops this incredible line, It was probably just one of the audio tapes rewinding. I mean, of course it would have tapes. And of course you would have to rewind them. The wild thing is, there are likely people listening to this right now that have no idea what rewinding a tape even means. <laughs> so, if you haven't already, check this one out. It's corny, yeah, but it's fun, and it's good. You will especially love this one if you're a fan of Kirk versus the computer stuff that they played a lot in the original series. Command codes verified. Why are you freaking out? Like, why are you freaking out, man? How often... Do leaders and managers get hyped up, stress out everyone around them, and then just start freaking out? It happens way too often. And the thing is, it's almost always over something that doesn't actually matter. Let's look at how Captain Kirk comports himself during this dangerous, but maybe not so critical situation they find themselves in. The Starfleet Leadership Academy is supported by listeners just like you. Click the link in the show notes to support the ongoing production of this podcast. There is very little in this world and this life that feels as good as being a hero. I think that's why properties like Star Trek, Marvel Cinematic Universe, Star Wars, and, and even stuff like Mission Impossible and Fast and Furious are so popular. They're all the stories of heroes in one way or another. Almost every piece of popular media for the last, the last, well, as long as I can remember, uses the hero's journey as the template for their stories. According to writer Joseph Campbell, who's a pretty polarizing individual, but he offered us this great piece of knowledge. He says, there are 12 stages in the hero's journey, and you're going to see these in a lot of the media we watch today. There's the call to adventure, then refusing the call, finding a mentor or teacher, finding allies, facing the first threshold, the road of trials, approaching the cave, the ordeal, a reward, the road back, resurrection, and returning home. These are divided into the traditional three-act structure, with those acts representing separation, descent and initiation, and then return. This is a wildly compelling narrative structure that can be found in some of the earliest writings known to man and still shows up in our modern-day blockbusters. But the attraction to this concept often goes well beyond entertainment. Many of us want our own hero's journey. We want to know 
that the challenges we're facing and the things that we're learning now will one day either help us help those from where we're from, which can be as local as your neighborhood or or as vast as the galaxy, or (laughs) just make you look super cool to a lot of people. This attraction sometimes causes us to do stupid things. Yeah, no nuance here, just dumb, stupid things. And sometimes those stupid things are big and full of bravado. Buying that big old enterprise software that you don't really need, but people seem to want. Maybe confronting your CFO in the middle of the office so everybody can see you call them out on their terrible budgeting. Or it could be going head to head with an enemy, even though there is no way for you to come out victorious. Now, all of that might seem like a real departure from this episode, but I actually think it beautifully sets up the key points I want to cover. How to objectively prioritize tasks, creating the appropriate amount of stress and pressure around them, and understanding when it makes sense to make the big and dangerous choice and when it doesn't. In Star Trek, despite showing us a more utopian future, they still reward violence. Like, they're the Klingons, always seeking glory through combat. Glory to you and your house. The Herogen that are constantly hunting their prey. And then there's the Federation. They also reward violence. They reward excellence in battle, for example. Both Kirk and Picard received the Grand Kite Order of Tactics class of excellence for outstanding performance in battle. So if someone wanted to stand out and be seen as a hero, they're likely going to be on the lookout for opportunities to do cool stuff when fighting others. That opportunity comes up almost right away in this episode. The Enterprise is on a routine mission and runs into three Romulan ships. Now, we don't know what kind of ships they were. Like, are they birds of prey? The Derridex class? You know, how dangerous are they? How powerful are they? Frankly, that doesn't really matter here. And likely, that wasn't even a thought back in 74. But it seems clear that these are no-nonsense Romulan vessels. Outnumbered and outgunned, Kirk has a real chance for glory. And Scotty even eggs him on. But Kirk understands there's no value in being a hero here. The potential gain is not worth the lives of the people on his ship. Let's give the heathens a fight they won't soon forget. Negative. We've suffered damage and we're out number three to one. I think this is an instance where discretion is the better part of valor. I love this so much. And it's so contrary to so much of the media we watched back then and even now. Frankly, this really shows the leadership maturity in James T. Kirk. When you're faced with choices like this that honestly will most likely not involve Romulans, right? But they could involve customers, coworkers, board members, and anyone else you interact with at work. But when you're faced with these situations where you can blaze in, phasers charged and photon torpedoes loaded, ask yourself one Very simple question. What will my team gain from this? And then consider the consequences of failing in whatever you're going to do. Kirk does this in a heartbeat. What will the Enterprise or even the Federation gain from engaging with the Romulans? Well, maybe some medals, maybe some recognition from the Admiralty. But then what are the consequences for failing? Most apparently is the death of at least 200, maybe up to 400 people, depending on where you're getting your crew count numbers from. But either way, a whole bunch of people could die. And on top of that, it could spark a war between the Federation and the Romulans. So Kirk makes the wise decision and gets out of Dodge. There's a situation from my days at the movie theater that comes to mind. It's not nearly the scale of the Romulans, but maybe it'll make sense to you. Almost everyone that goes to the movies is there to have a good time, and a lot of them are even cheerful and friendly when they show up. But just like in our social lives, there are those people that show up actively looking for a reason to be upset and offended. Well, one of these people showed up and decided the ticket taker at the door was going to be the target of their ire. For context, the guy working the door, well, we'll call him Don, was in his early 70s and worked part-time at the theater so he'd have something to do during the day, and he'd get free movies. He was super cool. He was very dependable. So our intentionally offended customer is upset about something. I don't, I don't remember what. Probably the ticket prices or showtimes. Maybe, maybe even how far they had to walk to their auditorium. I don't know. 
The reason isn't the important thing here. What is, is that they were raising their voice to Dawn and doing that firm, like driving your finger into the table thing on the ticket-taking podium. Dawn was clearly getting upset and scared. So I ask myself, what will my team gain from me cutting this customer off? Well, safety and dignity came to mind right away. And what would the consequences be if I screwed up and I escalated the situation? I'd certainly cause a scene in the middle of the lobby and probably lose at least one customer. Considering that the people I work with are my number one priority, this was an easy choice. I charged up phasers and I flew in at attack speed. Fire everything! <laughs> The point here is that as a leader, you influence many people and your decisions can have real impacts for them. And you have to know what that looks like. Following the example of Captain Kirk in this moment and throughout the entire episode makes this pretty easy. Keep a level head, remain objective in your assessment of the situation, listen to your team, but don't blindly follow every suggestion they have. And then, most importantly, make the decision and act on it. Your opportunities to do this won't be limited to big, obvious hero moments like these. In fact, those are usually pretty few and far between. Where we have the most impact on this for the people we work with is in how we approach the daily work. Are you a person that's stressed out, anxious, and makes the people around them feel the same? Or are you more chill, just taking the stuff the day throws at you in stride? Either way, or wherever you land in between those ends of the spectrum, the way you carry yourself will be reflected in the people around you. It's, it's just how it works. But why are there such differences in how we show up? I mean, yes, part of it is our personality. I think that's a given. But the big impact, the real reason, is how we look at the work and the tasks in front of us. I imagine we've all worked for the person that treats everything like a crisis and an emergency. They're running around, putting out fires, and honestly just freaking people out. The interesting thing here is that most of those perceived fires that they're excitedly putting out are fires that they actually started. We can probably all agree that it sucks working with these people. It's no fun at all. I, I remember when I reported to a person like this, ugh, my stomach hurt every day I got into the car to drive to work. I was wiped and exhausted when I got home and, and I'm pretty sure I never actually accomplished anything meaningful at work. The flip side to that can be almost as bad. The person that never treats anything like an emergency. Truck didn't show up with the item you've been advertising for weeks and people are already lined up to buy it. Eh, it's cool, man. Whatever. Like, it's all right. Building is literally on fire with ponies and kids and leprechauns caught in the blaze. Smooth. Yeah, man. Smooth. Yeah, sometimes... Things really are emergencies or crises, and you need to respond appropriately. Back in the 31st episode of the podcast, Elementary Dear Data, I outlined an exercise I'm going to give the high-level treatment to here. You list all the tasks that come up for your team. The daily tasks, the weekly stuff, the monthly, quarterly, even the weird stuff that only comes up sometimes. Once you've developed that list, you break those tasks up into one of three categories. Critical, urgent, or routine. Critical means you need to take action immediately or terrible things will happen. People are going to get hurt. You'll suffer serious loss or property damage, like big, bad stuff you have to drop everything for. Urgent is the important stuff that you need to handle soon, like within a few hours, maybe a few days. And routine is just that, the routine stuff you handle all the time. To go back to the earlier analogy, the first person, the apparent firefighter, treats everything like it's critical while the totally laid-back person treats everything like it's routine. Neither of those are good or helpful. An effective leader will treat each task as exactly what it is, critical, urgent, or routine. To help you in deciding which category to place each task in, I offer some questions to ask. Much like the earlier examples, ask how the task benefits your team and also how it moves you closer to your goals. Also, again, ask what the consequences of not doing the task will be. Quick, quick story on this one, actually. Not too long ago, we implemented a new piece of software that the team does their primary work in. One of the cool advantages to the software is some customers can directly interface with it, eliminating the need for our team to do data entry or data validation. 
We spent, I don't know, about 90 development hours, a couple tens of thousands of dollars to build this out for one of our big customers. They were involved in every step and we were getting excited for them to take advantage of this. Then they had sweeping changes in their leadership and all of a sudden they wanted nothing to do with this. Keep the old process, they said. Our people can't learn new ways of doing things, they said, which that's an entirely different topic we'll, we'll explore, but I'll save that for another day. But needless to say, with this news, team and I were pretty upset. I was borderline furious. I escalated this up as high as I could, and our chief operations officer asked me a great question. What do you lose if they don't adopt the tool? I thought about it, and I likely came up with uh, probably a similar answer to the one you've come up with thinking about this. Frankly, we'd lose about 90 hours of development time and a couple tens of thousands of dollars, which in the big picture for us, is kind of nothing. That reframed the whole situation for me and helped me to calm the down. Okay, so we have looking at how the task benefits the team and moves you closer to your goals, and then what are the consequences of not doing the task? Beyond that, consider time sensitivity. Is there a deadline? Is it a hard deadline, or is it a deadline that you or someone else just totally made up? Is it a deadline that someone downstream from you in the process is relying on so they can start their work? So consider those things and the time sensitivity. Then consider if the task is providing long-term or short-term benefits. Generally speaking, the tasks that have longer lasting impacts should take priority. And finally, how does the task align with your personal and organizational values. In my earlier example of Don getting berated by a customer, part of my decision-making was my personal value of prioritizing the people I work with over everything else. I, I love so much about this exercise. See, 100, literally 100% of the time that I go through it with my teams or the teams of people that I'm supporting or working with, <laughs> they are completely blown away by the results. It's often quite humbling, really. I remember the first time I ever did this exercise with one of my teams, a team where the prior leadership were of the, uh, the firefighting ilk, right? We got through the exercise and we found, as most teams do, that absolutely nothing we had was critical. Like, we even at one point talked about a literal fire, right? Like, if there's a fire, surely that must be critical. Lives are at stake, right? Property and inventory are at stake. But really, whether you're present or not, there are systems and processes already in place to handle this. The team does fire drills. They know how to get out. You've got sprinklers or other fire suppression systems in place. Usually the fire department, the actual firefighters, are on their way pretty quickly. While it's humbling to realize that none of your tasks are actually critical, it's also incredibly freeing. You get to settle down you can chill out. Captain Kirk was faced with some monumental challenges in this episode. He had to deal with the three Romulan ships, avoiding destruction and a potential war. And he had a computer that was losing it and putting the entire crew at risk. His ability to ask these questions and understand what was truly critical and what wasn't allowed him to remain calm and level-headed, ultimately leading to the Enterprise solving both problems. I've mentioned it here before, but I want to bring it up again. If you're benefiting from the topics I bring here on the podcast and my approach to them, you can have even more. In fact, you can have me. Head over to starfleetleadership.academy slash contact and let me know you're interested in coaching or consulting services and we'll see if we're a good fit or not. That's starfleetleadership.academy slash contact. You can also find me on Twitter and Mastodon at SFLA Podcast and Instagram at Jeff T. Aiken. That's Jeff, T as in tricks aren't always funny, A-K-I-N. Computer, what are we going to watch next time? Working. The 19th episode of the fifth season of Voyager, The Fight. If you're one of the Voyager faithful, you know this one is the Chakotay boxing episode. Dubbed the Maquis, Mahler Chakotay makes first contact with a super unique alien life form. I've always enjoyed boxing. Frankly, I like most combat sports, really. So I'm really looking forward to watching this one with you. 
And until then, ex astra scientia.